When Joe turned his cap back and sent Mallard clattering and clanging into the record books, of course Joe, Tommy and Mallard quite deserved the limelight in the years afterwards. But what about the train that Mallard was pulling? At the time the seven or eight train could boast that they were the fastest coaches in the world and those coaches could go on to do what coaches do best, but be blended back into the rolling stock of the LNER. But there was one coach that if it wasn't there, Mallard's run would have counted for nothing, the dynamometer car. Ever since the start of the modern industrial steam train, there have been calls to accurately measure just how effective the engine was. George Stevenson developed a device to measure traction force, and in 1839, Charles Babbage from the Great Western Railway converted a passenger carriage to include measuring equipment for not just measuring pulling force and traction, but it measured just how the carriages behaved on the curves, right down to measuring the vertical oscillation of the train. Babbage had a very good reason for these measurements, and it wasn't just to help improve the engine. In the days preceding the Great Gauge War, it was important for the Great Western to get every ounce of measurement and evidence in order to help fight their corner. The first car resembling anything like a dynamometer car was constructed in 1856 by Daniel Gooch. Rather than retrofit a passenger coach, he produced a measuring van. The van would sit directly behind the locomotive and measure not only the speed, but the engine's pulling force. This results, though, the results though could not be read on the move and had to be analysed after the run was complete. It was a definite improvement as it doesn't remove a coach from use, but getting the results was not a quick affair. The first true dynamometer cars with rolling results was developed in the USA in 1891. Using measurement carriages and wagons were actually practiced quite widely in the USA. Other private railways produced their own, including 3591, built exclusively for the North Eastern Railway in 1906. 3591 was markedly different to its predecessors. For starters, it was fitted to the hilt with all sorts of new recording equipment, which allowed for more parts of the locomotive to be monitored, including the draw, the amount of steam used per hour, the acceleration, and even the superheater and smoke box temperatures. The results could be seen in real time on the move, with two operators able to work side by side. It even had facilities for the workers to rest, including toileting facilities and a rest area, ideal for experiments over a long period of time. In 1923, the LNER inherited the dynamometer car from the grouping and it was renumbered to 23591 in 1928. Over the next 10 years, it was fitted with more monitoring equipment, including carbon output meters, steam temperature monitors for the engine cylinders, and of course, that all-important speedometer. The central measuring wheel could be lowered within the car using a winding gear. The wheel was connected to a 30-leaf spring and the main output console. This was a rolling paper feed with a pen device. Think earthquake seismometer and you get the gist. There was also a button device that the researchers could press that would record any important milestones on the line, such as marker posts. On the 30th of November 1934, the dynamometer car was marshalled to be part of a four-coach test train from King's Cross to Leeds. At its head stood the Flying Scotsman. The Flying Scotsman was, at the time, the poster child for the LNER, having both represented them at the National Exhibition and in 1928 was the first engine to travel non-stop from London to Edinburgh thanks to its new corridor tender, allowing for crews to be swapped while on the move. 30 years prior, the Great Western had boasted that City of Truro had reached the fable speed of 100 miles per hour. However, the claims could not be verified due to the person recording the results had previous inaccuracies with similar results and he was the only person noting the speed. Across the pond and in other countries, other railways were getting close to the ton and making similar claims, so the LNER wanted to throw its hat into the ring. 
It wanted to push Flying Scotsman to its limit, and for 600 yards between Byron and Estine, the dynamometer proved on paper to everyone once and for all that the engine had reached the holy grail of 100 miles an hour. It was undisputed and the first ever irrefutable proof. The run had an ulterior motive of just showing off. The new streamlined services of the Silver Jubilee was hot on the heels of the Scotsman and the LNER had to prove that the lines could cope with the increased speeds. But it didn't stop them claiming bragging rights against the other members of the Big Four and rubbing the achievements in their faces every chance they got. But in Germany there was a rumbling. The new engine, nicknamed the Flying Hamburger, was making a lot of noise. Not only was it averaging speeds of around 77 miles an hour, but it was doing this with a new type of diesel engine. It was a serious contender for the title of King of the Track, and it was a taster of things to come. But at the time, steam was still more cost effective. It didn't stop German designers applying what they had learned from the flying hamburgers to their own steam locomotives, making them just as fast. The LNER and Gresley were keen to tackle the hamburger head on, and in 1935 the first ever A4 rolled out of the works. The engine was like nothing anyone had ever seen, and the masses loved the Art Deco feel and the streamlined curves inspired by Bugatti. On the 27th of September 1935, the dynamometer car was once again whizzing down the line, this time behind Silver Link, clocking up 112 miles an hour, blowing Scotsman's record to bits. The LNER though didn't hold the record long, and the contender was none other than the LMS. The LMS had been developing its own streamlined services for a while now, and was challenging the LNER for speed dominance. William Stanier's Coronation Scott flew into the record books at 114 miles an hour. However, it wasn't without consequence, as the LMS had to replace all of the crockery in the dining car following the run. After this, it was mutually decided between the LMS and the LNER that racing down the main line was not the safest option for publicity, so a truce was called. However, the truce didn't extend to Germany, and on the 11th of May 1936, number 05002 reached 124.5 miles an hour, and just two weeks later, it averaged out 86 miles an hour. While not intentional to break the speed record, it was done to impress the top Nazi brass, and the train included many monsters of the Second World War, including the top men responsible for using the railways for a much deadlier purpose. The LNER desperately wanted its speed record back, not only to save face, but to show Germany just what English locos can really do, and give them a moral bashing. On the 3rd of July, 1938, Mallard was steamed up in King's Cross Yard, where the dynamometer car was marshalled and waiting, having just arrived just 24 hours before. Mallard was chosen specifically. Not only was it just five months old, it was the first of its kind fitted with a Clychap double blast pipe. After the car, six new luxury carriages followed. While Gresley was not able to be on the train due to illness, his deputy was. The crew for the train was specially selected, although neither Joe or Tommy had any idea what the run was about. But Joe was known for pushing his trains, and his demeanour of doing what it takes to get the job done was perfect for this task. In the dynamometer car, test inspector Dennis Carling was in charge. His first run to Baxton South Junction was fairly ordinary. However, as the engine and car were being turned, Dennis Carlin announced the real reason for the run. Climb the hill at Stoke Bank and let a fly down the hill regulator at full tilt. Despite the mighty mile an hour speed limit, Joe took the task and understood. Both train and car set off, and as they did so, the lights in the dynamometer car failed. But this didn't deter Dennis. He kept all eyes on the speedometer. Tommy then turned a speed restriction at Grantham 
into an opportunity and to stoke his fire into a roar. Once passed, Jo opened up the regulator and eased her up the hill, increasing her speed gently. They passed Stoke's signal box at 85 miles an hour. It flew through the tunnel, creating a shower of hot cinders as Jo pushed the engine further. Then, at the moment he crested the hill, Jo opened up the regulator fully. The gravity and momentum they had gained, pushing the speedometer needle higher and higher. Funnily enough, the speedometer in the car topped out at 120 miles an hour. So Dennis had to rely on the paper as evidence. He measured quarter mile by quarter mile, and there was no doubt. Mallard had topped 126 miles an hour. There were 11 people that witnessed the moment the needle topped out, and the LNER had the press waiting when they stopped. But rather than greet the engine, they were ushered into the car where the evidence lay for them to photograph. As for the Germans, they were very, very silent. They were proud of their might, speed and force of their trains, and to have their pride squashed by an engine named after a duck must have been very humiliating. The onset of the Second World War squashed any further speed attempts, and when in 1948 the Big Four was merged to be British Railways, speed records were becoming a thing of the past. But this was not the end of the dynamometer car. It was taken under British Railways wing for one final hurrah. In 1948, British Railways inherited a whole mix of engines with a whole different range of workings, and British Railways were keen to standardise their own fleet. They wanted to know what best qualities of each engine was, and the only way to do this would be testing. Working with the dynamometer cars from the LMS, the Great Western and the LNER, they were all used with a range of different locomotives from around the country. The test also included different areas to test the engine's abilities in different environments. The results were very exciting and helped British Railways standardise the fleet. This was the last time the dynamometer car was used in any official capacity and both the car and the paper record of the run was firstly donated to the Museum of British Transport in Clapham before being moved to the museum and saved for the nation. In the 1980s following Mallard's retirement it was paired up again and it's extremely rare to ever see the pair apart. The dynamometer car has remained pretty much untouched since the very last time it was used and using steps to peer into the windows, you can still see evidence of the last run. It's the only vehicle in the museum to have an odd number of wheels and the car is beautifully kept in its imitation teak livery and retains its post-war number 902502. Nowadays, your phone can do some of the things the car can, for example using GPS to monitor the engine speed, but I would definitely go see the car at the National Railway Museum if you can. And it's staggering just how much could have been analysed on your morning commute.